Um, I see that. I feel like I'm on romper stomper, domper do, romper room. I don't know if any of you remember that. I do. I, I see Ellen. dating myself. Once again, I Ellen, see Michelle and Lisa, and I see Courtney, Kristen, and Aaron, uh, and Kristen and Lisa. Uh, Courtney and Aaron, are you guys able to hear? If you can't speak, if you could type into the box so we can make sure that we're all good there. Courtney can hear us. Awesome. Great. Hopefully, Aaron can as well. Um, Michelle, do you want to shoot her a, a text or something? Sure. There's Erin. She can hear. Oh, she can hear. Oh. But it's saying she has her volume turned up all the way. Okay. Is that better? I'm turning mine up. I'm using my phone rather than the, um, the computer because my internet connection is slow here, but at least it's consistent. Hmm. Still saying, sorry. Sorry, Lisa. I mean, I so, sorry, you. Aaron. I can but, hear you fine. I'm not sure maybe if it's Aaron's connection or. Okay. All right. Well, I'm hoping that that will get better. Um, we, uh, you could start recording. You are. Michelle is recording this session already, guys. And um, before I forget, we do have the November session has been posted. Um, has been uploaded. I know a couple of folks had to miss that session, so you'll be able to uh, hear that one. So looking at our notes um, for, for today, and there's um, two ways, well, one way probably for you guys to get at it. In the online resource, um, when you go under December, it says, you know, uh, December 18, uh, COP notes and that's an embedded uh, Google document. Um, and I can, uh, Michelle, I have it open larger, so I don't know how large it gets for yours if you go into it, if you want to give me the screen, folks can see oh, it. Give me the screen. <clears throat> give me one second. Ellen. All righty. Ellen, make presenter. Make me beautiful. Okay, or make me the presenter. Either way is fine. Boy, that gets huge. Let me make it smaller. Okay. So there we go. So we read um, chapter four, defining purpose, process, and product. And we had some guiding discussion questions for that that we'll go through. I also um, recall when we first started this community practice, we said that each month part of it was would be discussion of the reading, and part of it would be uh, an opportunity for coaches to share out. I have been, um, we haven't had a lot of coach, you know, coaches reaching out to say, oh, I really want to share something, or I have a question, but I did have a question come up the last time, um, uh, or since our last meeting. My screen's gotten weird. Um, and so I wanted to put that question that, that the coach presented to me out to the group. So if it's all right, my hope is that we would um, stop discussing the reading and also look at resources that had come up last time we said we would look at, that we would stop that by about um, 1235, maybe 1240 at the most, um, and then discuss this question that. Um, that a coach had. Um, so if anyone has any concerns about that, please let us know. Um, and certainly if there are any questions that any of you guys have or any you know, big successes that you'd like to share um, next month, please reach out to us and let us know. I, I, I'm, I'm remembering our last face-to-face -face meeting last year where you guys were presenting that really seemed to be something everyone enjoyed and wanted the opportunity to do more of. So I don't want to just be the only one chatting here. Um, okay, so the ch chapter was on defining purpose, process, and product, and um, talked about, you know, starting with what what is the vision for your team, what is the team's purpose, and I think we talked a little bit even about vision last time, but um, 
I was curious what you guys, when you were reading that section, thought, and would your team members know what the team's purpose is? So. Who has thought? Well, I, I could uh, start that I think we don't um, spend enough time on that. I, I thought last year that team members that were coming together to talk about, about school-wide data um, really understood why they were there. And it seemed to make perfect sense. But then you had to account for everybody's um, ability to kind of catch up with what everybody else is doing, you know, and I think that we just took it for granted and, and we had to clarify a lot more this year. Um, so our, our uh, math interventionists and our reading specialists joined our MTSS team last year because that was new for us. And so I don't think they saw themselves as leaders in that sense and that they didn't really have much to contribute, but I think they see it now. So, it, Kristen, am I hearing you say last year um, when the interventionists joined, they didn't see themselves as as leaders? In what way? Well, they were – so I don't know if everybody is kind of tackling this problem, but we have um, – we had some contract issues. We had meeting time issues. And so we had to kind of separate out um, our leadership school-wide teams which consists of the principal, a social worker, and our two interventionists, reading specialists in math. And okay. um, they met, they meet, but I think they didn't see themselves as tier one. They kind of only saw themselves with groups. They didn't understand how they could contribute to the bigger picture and that they would be considered a leader for school-wide kind of issues as well. Gotcha, gotcha. So, but this year you feel as though they do have more of a sense of that? I, th I think so. And I would say that I, I believe that they have a better sense because what we've really tried to do is tie in everything they do to their school improvement plan. So whatever goals are, you know, on that school improvement plan, that is their action plan for the year. And so, you know, most of our schools, they, they would all have a math and a, a reading goal, but they've never in the past, because they were new, helped to write that. So they kind of own it, in a sense. Okay, so they own it now. Is that right. what I'm hearing? Right. And Prior to this, yeah, okay. they just had their own, you know, faculties would just form their own school improvement teams, and they would be teachers and whatnot, but because the interventionists are somewhat new in Warwick, they, um, they now have a bigger role. They are looking at how they are going to implement some actions to get the core for those things, math and reading, up and running. And and I'm curious. It seems to me that it, with with them having that ownership, you you'd see more engagement with them and more more buy-in. Yeah, I feel. Their, their effectiveness is probably going to be tied to how the team does. Right. And I, I think the more we keep bringing it back there, the more that they're starting to understand, yeah, I'm, I, I can kind of consult with teachers, push this so that even with that push, their are groups of uh, students that need that tier two and three should start to shrink. I mean, when they first started, they felt like they could – intervene with everybody, like we always, you know, feel, because no right. one's really in the core. Yep. So I, my point was just to share that I think that sometimes it takes more time for people to understand the bigger picture, and just saying it, and, you know, a few times, I think they really have to live it for a while. Right, right. Cool. Thank you for sharing that. I'm trying to capture um, <laughs> the gist. I like what you said. They need to live it for a while. Okay. Um, what else do we have? Courtney has typed in 
and our target team has laser, fo laser focus and purpose. But I would say that our RTI teams and building leadership teams have a lot of gray area that need cleaning up. Um, I'm gonna see if I can copy and paste that. No, I can't, oh, maybe I can. I won't attribute it to anyone in the notes. Hey, that makes it easier. Um, and um, so Courtney, I wonder, do you have a sense for why it might be that the target team has a focus and a purpose, but the other two are, are less clear on that? And um, others, do you have any guesses as to why that could be the case in a school or if it's the case in your school? So the target team's been around the longest and has a group of staff that has the most MTSS and NCII training. And for the folks who, who might not be familiar with the NCII training, that's, um, and Courtney, correct me if I'm wrong, but I read that as a lot of the non-responder, the tier three um, intensifying supports work that we've done with schools, um, we got from National Center on Intensive Intervention from our work with them. Um, Courtney went on to say, we also have new leadership, three new admins, that have some different views on MTSS. And Courtney, do you think that that's contributing to the other teams not being really clear? Absolutely, yeah. I know that I've been in schools and I'm curious if other folks have experienced this, where um, absolutely we're all on the same page. We all want the same thing. We want school-wide improvement. We want um, fewer, you know, overwhelming uh, percentage of kids meeting with success at tier one. We want to have good, tight decision rules and procedures for tier two and a consist consistent way of individualizing at tier three. But you can get a new leader to come in the building who just doesn't have the same exact vision and framework or hasn't had the same experience with a, a, tr a training model um, or, or a way of accomplishing that goal. And it's almost like you, you're, it, I think of that movie Lost in Translation <laughs> when you're talking at total odds with one another. I don't know if anyone else has experienced that. Michelle has her hand up. Well, yeah, yes, Literally. Oh, thank you very much. Literally. I, you know, ironically, I just came from a meeting this morning where I've been working with two separate schools in the same district and at one of the schools, the principal left, just recently left, and they brought in the principal from the other school who had been working with me with MTSS into this building. And even though there are the foundational understanding is the same, there are just differences that are happening within that particular building. So we're having to have a reset meeting with their MTSS team. The members are the same, but the leadership has changed. So we're going in and having a different you know, basically resetting and bringing everybody back to the same page just to know that we're all following the same direction. It's kind of like, you know, when you get in a car to go on a road trip with your husband and you're thinking one thing and your husband's thinking another thing and you planned it out ahead of time and somebody doesn't want to stop for the world's biggest ball of wax and somebody does and, you know, just trying to get on the same page. Um, so you're having a, what you're calling a reset meeting to get everyone on the same um, page. And, and I just want to go back. Courtney said, Ellen, that was well said. Well, you always have the best comments, Courtney. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the new admin is student focused and we just need to work to blend our new ideas and establish processes. It's, I, I'm going back to that whole braiding initiatives, what, you know, if you if you oftentimes step back and bring people back to well, what's our goal what's your goal what's my goal well look we really have the same goal how can we how can we work together that helps michelle you're doing a reset meeting is that with you as like an outside consultant facilitating that yeah yes um i'm wondering is 
is are there ways of places doing it without bringing someone in from outside Probably. has anyone ever if, if they had a stronger that. internal coach that had set up, the problem was that they were just getting traction. I use this example on them to game today because it's almost like if you've ever driven a standard up a hill and you had to stop and then restart and you, you kind of roll back a little bit before you get going again. That's what this team has done repeatedly. And, and they haven't, they were just at a point of having an internal coach type person, but then the administrator left. So that, person isn't going to overstep the new administrator coming in. So it's just a, just a way to, I think there'll finally be poised to do that. But sometimes, right. You know, like if you had one person in a district that was doing that, that could be helpful. Like that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. I've been true with the, that level of um, professional development coordinator, instructional leader, but it's not always the mm -hmm. case in a lot of districts. Okay. All right. Anyone else have? Can, can oh, you hear Aaron. me? Yes, I can. I'm having better luck with a headset microphone. Um, oh, this good. whole conversation resonates with me so much. Um, I'm in the same district with Courtney and just, you know, the, my, my building teams, I think, have a really good focus and understanding of their purpose. We've been working on that for a couple of years now, and Michelle's been a great support. But at the district level, it's really hard to keep momentum going when it feels like there's kind of a musical chairs game with administrators sometimes. And sometimes they stay and go to different buildings. Sometimes they leave. Sometimes, you know, key members of a team leave. And I always feel like I'm, I feel like they're probably sick of me stating, all right, this is our purpose. This, this is why we're here. This is what we're doing. But I feel like I have to keep it stuck together to you know, rephrase it for people that have been there and then reframe, you know, frame it for people that are just coming on board. And it's just always, it's so hard to keep the momentum going when, when everybody keeps leaving. And especially I'm talking about the administrators. I don't know if that's a problem everywhere, but it makes it hard at the district level. So I, I, I think a lot of people, a lot of heads are probably nodding here. Um, I said recently to someone, they were, they were I was actually talking with a family member and um who used to have kids in a district that I've been in and I've said, you know, oh this this district's amazing and got kind of the rolling of the eyes and I say, I understand districts are like um, you know, almost like snakes. I know that sounds awful, but they shed their skin every couple of years. It's like it just changes completely. Um and and it's really amazing how often that happens. Um, one of the things that we've noticed there's been some success with, and we're at the point now, I think, where there are enough people spread out in the state and, and in the country that have a knowledge. You're still not going to get that lost in translation thing that we were talking about before, but um, that no M R R T I P B I S M T S S that if when positions are changing, um, someone's leaving and the position's being posted, that making sure that, you're, that the district is asking questions about what is your vision for MTSS and what do you think is important and you know, what do you see as, as a team's um, vital roles, that doing that can help ensure that the person who's hired is a little more in sync. It's still not going to be perfect. Uh, perfect. Um, Aaron's right. Uh, Aaron, you do a great job of of keeping everyone on track. But yeah, sometimes you do sound like a broken record. I'm sure. I know sometimes I sound like a broken record. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that? <clears throat> Well, and I have um, two subs for principals right now, so that takes a little uh, revisiting some some of the things that we worked on last year, trying to catch them all up. So I've been serving as sort of a facilitator in those schools to kind of catch them up. But as far as a district level, I um, am lucky enough that we've had a little bit of consistency. There's been some changes, but um, in the last year, two years, um, we've had monthly meetings. So we have scheduled those district leaders 
to meet with me now it used to be Melissa and I but um, and then we get a chance to kind of go through both building level teams and targeted team issues and um, kind of talk about data and, and catch them up so I think the more that I'm kind of in their face with those things the more they're thinking about them as well right um, thanks uh, Christian that's one one district that I'm working in doesn't meet monthly, but the district team it, it's it's been curious to me because the team is actually growing in size as we go along, which isn't what I've seen everywhere. Um, and they've got actually the the building coaches and administrator are part of the district team. So part of every meeting, which is like four times a year each building does share out what they're doing. And I'm not exactly sure how it's happen, happens, but Erin, this, this might be helpful. They always seem to go to a place of, um, I think of Meg Ryan and when Harry met Sally, I want what she's having. And, and so if one team starts, one school starts reporting something that's going well, um, you know, another school will say, well, we want to do more of that. And they always seem, and. I, I can't figure out how it's happened, but to get to a place of, well, let's, let's do that as a district team. So they, they keep a focus, which is good. I wish I could tell you how that was happening, but I don't know how. But Kristen, how did you get to have monthly meetings? How did you get to establish that? Because that seems like a, um, yeah. a I think uh, calendar. I think that um, originally it started with Sarah um, and she would have monthly meetings with us. And then um, when Sarah left, well, prior to her leaving, she tried to get our special ed director and our elementary director to sort of join our meetings. And so they were already scheduled for the years. But in addition to those people being at the monthly meeting, it now is our chief academic officer, our assistant special ed um, directors, and a couple of behavior specialists as well. So that has grown. Um, and I think it's important for me to keep bringing data to show them for all of their schools and to sort of kind of get them intrigued asking the next question. So I think that's um, been helpful. Uh, we just had one today, and I think that uh, the information that I presented, which was nothing or shattering that none of you would do, but I think they just don't realize they can have access to some information like that. I'm glad you. I'm glad you used the D word, um, <laughs> data. Well, and and that's interesting because I do think for for the folks at the district level, you know it's always like what's in it for me if you want to get people engaged and if you're able to show them data i think most folks at that level are understanding um, we've got to be able to measure outcomes and um i could see that really getting people interested in 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 being more engaged on a on a district level team oh what are you measuring how are you looking at that that's only going to help them achieve their goals the more people are looking at data. All right, okay, I'm realizing it's 10 to 25 and we're on question one. So actually we did kind of just start to go into question two, what are the student needs that your team addresses and what data supports that focus? Here's, here's I think another way of looking at that. What would your team members say are the, the student needs that your team addresses and what data supports that focus. Not sure if you guys are thinking or need me to restate that. So if, if any members on your team, and you could pick a building leadership team or a district team, but if you were to say to them, what, 
they might not have a firm grasp or, or be able to articulate what the team quote purpose is, but what are the student needs that our team addresses? Um, so if I were, if, if say Courtney or Erin, yeah, you're on my team and I just wanted to touch base and say, hey, so what's your view of what student needs do you think our team is addressing? Um, it's kind of a side way, I think, of saying, what do you think our purpose is? Uh, and, and what data do you have or not have that would support focusing on that student need? So Kristen said her building leadership team, their focus is on behavior and they use SWIFT for that. They focus also on social competence and they're using the social skills improvement scale. Three times a year they do that. Uh, they focus on attendance and engagement and use Aspen and academics. Um, they use Star Park and the RICAST. So, so Kristen, you feel as though you're able to say, we're focusing on student outcomes, it sounds like, and in each of these areas, these are the data points that we use. Would that be a... Uh, yes, yeah, that's fair. right. Um, all of our building level, building leadership teams use a Google um, sheet, and each sheet has its own area, and, um, or tab and they have thresholds uh, that they are supposed to put in each month as they take a pulse on behavior or you know three times a year for the social competence or attendance and they are looking to action plan based on those uh, percentages um, and all of that's supposed to be tied to their building uh, their school improvement plan so that, that sheet is sort of like kind of their guide. Um, they have an action plan on the front sheet, and then the other tabs just have their, their percentages and maybe a little bit more detail with Star and Park and you know kind of breaks it down to grade level in some cases. But we're still working on that and trying to get them to not just fill out the data but dig a little deeper, and I think that's really where the growth is. And is that digging a little deeper, like the um, school-wide database decision-making protocols that that we've been working with? Yes. Teams on? Uh, okay. okay. I did. Um, so we did. Both Melissa and I had trained them last year when they would come to us and kind of looking at that. But I think last year they weren't really at the right place. They were just seeing themselves as like a, a new team and didn't really understand what they their their role was. So this year, um, that is one of my goals, um, my own personal goal for my SOO is to kind of guide at least a few teams to kind of dig a little deeper into their academic or behavior. Um, some of them do it naturally, but I feel like mm -hmm. that's an area that really needs to grow a little bit more. Cool. And it sounds like you guys have a good or at least a starting routine, which may be beyond what a lot of other places have that actually at least has a tool that's consistent across buildings saying this Google Sheet is where your information should be captured and that you, at least they're setting the expectation that people are gonna look at this when they are action planning. Right. And I think, you know, if Sarah was still here, her goal was to, you know, put that in Aspen or build the dashboard for that. Um, but right now we're just using the Google Sheet and the sheet is shared with all of um, my district, you know, members as well. So we can always check in on their progress if someone's not there. Um, but it just at least gives them a little bit of a, a structure and a reminder. So I think that helps to get them started. And then I hope that we can build from there. Like they start using their time to dig a little deeper action plan around, you know, some things that maybe they're falling short in certain areas. 
I'm, I'm, so you're saying if I'm a work in one school, I have access to another school's Google Sheet? Is, is that what I was hearing you say? What that I'm it shared throughout the district? Well, each school only has access to their own, their own. Okay. Google. I have access to all of them. My, uh, okay. yeah, my elementary director has access. We can share that, that information at our monthly district level team. So I cool. can, so I try to go to a lot of meetings, but if I'm not able to, I can see on their, you know, check on their progress. That's, that's cool. Um, I think it, 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 it's a structure for accountability. We're going to be looking at it. So, you know, you know, but it's also means that you probably had to establish a culture in which um, people were not petrified of, of who was <laughs> going to look at that and what, what was going to come back. Yeah. Well, they may still be petrified. I have no idea. But okay. <laughs> I think that um, it was interesting when we rolled it out last year, they just liked having a place to put the information all in one spot. And so eventually, yep. I think they'll love it if it's, you know, not in a separate sheet, but in, in um, Aspen or something that we can just have one area to look. But I, I principals really seem to like it. It's kind of all yep. there information right there and they actually tweak the pages to kind of make it a little bit more meaningful for them cool all right now Erin said they primarily use screening data math and reading from star and behavior by referrals for now until we implement an SEL screening then we'll add that uh, we're also focusing on our action research project the LT team which created the school-wide DBDM protocol and creation of a SMART goal. So Erin, it sounds like, oh, and there's more. And then our district team actually has a chart with goals and team members, responsible timelines in progress. All right. It's, it's you know, I'm such a, a geek, but it's very cool to hear of all these processes that, that schools and districts are putting in place that are really advancing the work of MTSF being done better in schools. So, And I um, want to just put in a, like a pat on the back to Aaron, because I was at the district meeting when they were actually going over that action plan, which was a table at the end of their tips notes, which was really very cool the way that it was done. So very systematic, very organized, mm -hmm. very easy to track progress. Neat. Wonderful. All right. Okay. So I am, I'm noticing we have one more minute before I wanted to move on to a few other things and we did not get through many of our questions so what I want to do right now is ask you guys to look at the remaining questions which are is your purpose aligned with your school's district mission what process elements do you have in place to help your team work efficiently we've talked about a few of those what process elements could use more work how have you addressed team communication adequately? And what's the role of an annual action plan? We have touched on some of these, but is it, was there anything that as you guys were reading or preparing for this conversation that you said, oh, I wanna really let people know about X or Y uh, because I don't wanna move on to another section without having an opportunity to folks to share or if you had a question about something specifically. And if you guys could give me like a visual, I'm all set or good to go um, before I move on. I'm, the wait time is just bizarre for me when I don't have faces <laughs> or the verbal. Thank you. Kristen, Aaron. So Lisa and Courtney, we're going to assume that we're good to go on. I'm all set. Okay, wonderful, Lisa. Good to hear your voice. I miss you. Um, so last time that the, when we met, um, I forget the specific name, uh, you know, focus of the chapter, but a couple of resources from Elena Aguilar, who wrote the book that we are reading, 
were mentioned and folks had said, yeah, they'd love to have easier access to them. Um, so they were the core values activity, which we've done, um, the spheres of control cont uh, content, uh, the mind the gap activities, things like that. So I'll just show you quickly. In our community of practice note um, resource, here, how do I go back? December meeting, nope, here's where I wanna go. So in November, if you can see here November, the no I forgot to take notes on November like I'm doing today in the Google Doc, but I did put in November notes and resources and within that, I've put all of those resources that we talked about last time together. There are links that will take you out to Elena Aguilar's um, website, which is brightmorningteam.com. Um, and so there's the link to the core values activity, that's the directions, and the next one is the core values list. Some of you had said that might be something helpful to do with your team. Um, the spheres of in influence visual, you know, what do I have control over and what do I have influence with? Um, the Mind the Gap article, as well as the Mind the Gap framework, which is, it's a, it's a nice lens whenever you're having a coaching interaction. If someone isn't doing what someone really needs to be doing, um, Sometimes we assume it's a will gap. They know what to do. They can do it. They have the capacity. Uh, they've got everything they need. They just don't want to. But sometimes it might be something else. So that article and that visual can help with that. Um, so that's where those things were. Was there anything else? Can anyone remember that we talked about that maybe Michelle and I were brainstorming? Oh, what are those things that we said would would share with folks. I just wanted to make sure we got them all. All right, Erin's all set. Quick question, has anyone used any of those since last time? Since we talked about it, I know there were a couple of folks who said, oh, I, I may want to try that with my team. Erin um, did core values with her husband. That's awesome. Christmas is coming up. You could do, that, do it with the whole family gathered around the Christmas tree before, um, before maybe all hell breaks loose. Um, Courtney has not tried them yet, but, but might try them. I think, you, you know, it relates to so many of the things in, in each chapter that I'm reading and the chapters that we'll get to for next time. One is about, you know, um, we talked about trust already, but laying a foundation for trust and starting to think about the emotional intelligence of your team. Um, and, okay, so Kristen said, I've not, but would like to try one or two by the end of the year. All right, that can go on the front of your sheet, your Google sheet and your action plan. Um, okay, so those are, resources are there. And if there's one that comes to mind that we didn't get up there, just shoot us an email and we will get it there. Um, and then the last thing I wanted, and I'm, I am going a little quickly because I know some folks uh, might need to leave a little early today. I want to make sure we get to this. A coach who may or may not be a coach that's online today, may or may not be a coach in the practice, but ask this question and it's come up enough that um, I think it's worth us all discussing. How do you address the issue of a team member consistently violating your team norm? Further, what if that team member happens to be your supervisor? So. Some folks may say, well, maybe this isn't the right team for the person, but sometimes it's basically the administrator who is violating the team norm. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that and um, bring some feedback to the person or, or let them hear it while we're talking. Has anyone dealt with that type of situation? I've 
through your administrator or not. I was hoping that some of the administrators who are in our community of practice would be here today because I'd love to hear from them. How would you like someone to deal with that if you were um, an administrator who maybe is, is coming to meetings, not prepared, who's multitasking, who's blatantly off task um, or, or not staying solution focused, whatever the norms are. So thoughts, first of all, has anyone encountered this issue, either in your current position or another, and what thoughts do you have for this coach? So Erin shared, I had this problem with an admin a few years back. It was really difficult, but I had to have a private conversation with them and ask them to help me out by following the norms and setting a strong example. It was actually received well and improved. Thank you for sharing that, Erin. It was, I, I'm curious, was it a principal that you already felt like you had a pretty good relationship with? Or because people might feel more comfortable doing that conversation. It was someone that you already had a strong conversation um, relationship with. Yeah. Any other things? Courtney struggling. I have not addressed the issue yet. Um, the admins knew. Maybe you and Erin should talk. Um, and you do have a strong relationship with that person already? Is that what you're saying, Courtney? Oh, no, not yet. Yep, okay. I think, you know, there, just like with behavior, the function of behavior, it's so individual to a person and individual to a context. I, you know, I, in my past life, when I was a building coach in a building, ran into this in two buildings and for two t entirely different reasons and um, didn't have a great relationship with either. But I know one of the people that I was dealing with, um, I didn't have a great relationship, but it was never gonna be a great relationship. And I still had to, I had to do basically what you said, Erin, deal with it head on and, and explain, you know, here are the things I tried to say objective. Um, and just, just stating exactly what the behaviors were and how that erodes, you know, the team's functioning and ask them to stop. And they did stop. Uh, but that was a person who was never going to do it without someone saying, hey, <laughs> you can't do this anymore. I don't know. Has anyone else had a, a, a different approach or you didn't even deal with this, but here's a, a thought or a suggestion. You know, this is Michelle. I, I would say that if you do choose to go the route of having a direct conversation with someone, trying to figure out what their personal style is that will be best received of new information. So, you know, I'm taking a play out of the school site consultation playbook here where you know, we all have our preferred communication styles that we communicate with others or that we'd like to receive communication. So if we know what the best way is to have that conversation, so whether it's to give a scenario in a non-emotional non context, so having a conversation, you know, I'm looking to you for some advice. There's a situation in a team and, and think about ways that you could pick that person's brain so that they're actually, it's right on the tip of their, their forefront. Or I, and this is something I've done in my past outside of education. I have actually had difficult conversations with my superiors to let them know that certain actions that they had taken um, made my job more difficult or was not being seen in a positive light by other individuals. So, but I think that 
you know, up here in New England, people are tend tend to be very head on in dealing with issues, but not everybody when it comes to their own behavior likes it that way. But I I would hope that everybody wants to ensure that their behavior isn't an impediment to another group of people moving forward or having prog progress. Aaron says flattery always works well. That's good when you remind somebody in a positive way how much they have to offer. That will inspire them. I know someone like me, if somebody tells me in some way that my behavior is a detriment to them or their their progress, like I take it very personally and I and I want to change that. And I guess we all assume other people are like that, but even if other people aren't that way, they need to either figure out how to get out of the way and stop being a barrier. Um, but there are, and I, I know some of Ellen's past challenges. First, you got to figure out, is the person really <laughs> stable? Like, and, and answer that question <laughs> first, because that might tell you the direction that you need to go in. So, I mean, there are legitimately yeah. people that are, you know, you, they're not unpredictable and how they're going to respond to things. And that's where it's much more difficult, the unpredictability. Right. I, and I think it, it I, you know, I, I had that situation, but, and while this person was the building administrator, they didn't have absolute influence over um, how my life was going to go. And I think that's different because if you're a coach who's, say, a teacher in a building and the principal is making it, impossible for the team to function. Uh, and I'm not saying this is to that point. That's a slightly different situation. Like, um, you know, how can this, how can the coach then go on with this? Um, has anyone ever utilized revisiting the norms or instituting a new routine within the, um, the team meeting so that it prompts either more pre-correction, hey, let's remember our norms, you know, at the beginning, or, hey, let's reflect on how specifically we're doing with that. Has anyone tried that? Uh, Kristen has typed in, um, I haven't had that degree of an issue, but I agree. I would look at a private conversation and try to see what the person is getting out of disrupting the meeting. We'll also try to find a way to complement something they say or try to get them to see we could be on the same page. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you guys say is passive aggressive is probably not the thing to do, <laughs> but address it directly. Yeah. It's well, a tough I'd one. Probably be strategic about it because if not, there's going to come that day when you're having a bad day and they're having a bad day. And, you know, we've all said things in public situations that we wish we could take back because we never address something for so long and that's what you don't want to happen. You don't want to feel like you, you have behaved in a way that's not reflective of who you are. Um, and those are the worst. Right. Yeah. But sometimes it, you, the longer you let it go on, the more likely you're going to have that yeah. moment where you blow. Um, Courtney said exactly. Admin can be tricky to address when they are your superior. I have had success having private conversations with a few staff members who seemed to roadblock conversations. I found a lot of success in those. Cool. All right. Well, thank you. I will, um, I will probably like synthesize these thoughts. And if anyone has any others after the fact, if you could email them to me. Um, that happens to me all the time. I leave a meeting and usually I'm either driving or I'm in the restroom. Everyone knows this is my story. Um, and all of a sudden I'll remember, oh, this was a good thing to share. Um, of course, not in the restroom, but shoot me an email and um, because I'd like to be able to, to provide the coach with just some guidance. And, and it sounds like, um, you know, having a direct conversation is the way to go. And it's quite possible this person could rely on, you know, I, I, um, I saw guidance from other coaches, you know, and, and, you know, value your, your, what you do. She could have this conversation and, and how you contribute the flattery. Um, but I, I, I felt as though I had to talk with you about it or that that's the best way to go. We'll see. Maybe it'll give them the, the courage to do it. 
All right. Any other parting questions or thoughts? Um, our topics for move this over for next time we are together. Guiding questions. I'll be honest. I put them together kind of quickly. I'm I'm still looking at the chapters, so they may get tweaked a little. But we're reading chapter four, defining purpose, process, and product. And um, oh no, that's this month. Excuse me. Ignore that. We're looking at chapters five and six, laying the foundation for trust and developing the emotional intelligence of a team, which I think is, was really interesting. I hadn't really thought of teams from the perspective of emotional intelligence. Um, so if we don't have other thoughts or questions, I hope each of you have a wonderful, restful, restorative uh, break and um, look forward to seeing you all in January, the exact date of which is going to be, I'll get there, I'll get there. Whoops. Ellen, January 22nd. Is this a date we're going to need to change? Uh, January 22nd. I, I, I don't, I thought I could still do it. Okay. At that time, but do you, do you want to change it? I, I just wanted to ask. I'm okay. available. Michelle and, Michelle and I are traveling to a conference, so we will still be online, but we might not be in, online quite so locally. Mm -hmm. to have that. All right.